Hey, we're going to continue through 1 Peter. Please open your Bibles. If you do not have one, uh, there's a Bible over here, and we will bring it to you. You will need a Bible to follow along. And I encourage you, please, make sure you're bringing your Bible with you to church. Okay, so 1 Peter, we're still in chapter, chapter 1. Chapter 1 of 1 Peter is, um, is enormous. Uh, I was uh, intimidated when I, um, in prayer, felt the Lord was calling me to preach through this book because of, of how amazing and enormous this book is and the truth and theology that's brought forth is just incredible. Um, So we have made it to verse 17 uh, through 19. That's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, Last week, we started this verse, and um, we did not get through the entire sermon, so we're going to continue from where we were. Uh, But I'm going to draw us to pay first attention to verse 13, Uh, so that we can get some of the context of what's going on. So verse 13 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile." knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. This message uh, is a part two of love. Love causes healthy fear. And we need to understand that today. We need to understand the importance of what the Apostle Peter is conveying here. Remember, he's writing to a group of Christians who have been scattered or dispersed, the diaspora throughout Asia Minor. These people were under immense persecution, immense pressure. They were being killed. They were being thrown in prison. And so Peter is writing them this letter to bring encouragement to them. Now, he uses some phrases that can trip people up. So either people trip over these phrases or they just bypass them because they don't understand them. So, you know, what do you do with something in the Bible you don't understand? You either trip over it or you just, I don't know what that means, and you move on. Well, we're not going to do that. We need to know what God meant when he said what he said. So let's draw our attention back to verse 17. And if you call him on him as father. The word if there is important. It was translated that way because it implies responsibility. Peter is not causing doubt here when he says if. I know the NIV says since you call on him. That's a wrong translation. If is the correct translation because he's implying responsibility. He's saying, I know you call on him. You call on him means there uh, in the Greek, the call on the verb is a continuation, a continual action, meaning like in prayer. You call on the God of the universe, right? Remember Jesus when he said, When you pray, say, our Father. We're calling on the Father, the creator of all things, the master of the universe. If you call on him as Father, who judges impartially. What he's saying there, the word judges, is also pointing to the fact that the Father 
who, who speaks of compassion, right? A father, a, tr- a good father, has compassion for his children. But yet this father who has compassion is also a judge who judges impartially, meaning not a respecter of persons, meaning that there's no favoritism in the mind of God. He judges impartially, this father. If you call on him, if you pray to him, if you call yourself a Christian, remember that that father judges. He evaluates. He weighs. What does he weigh? According to each one's deeds. Now the word deeds there in the New American Standard Version and King James is translated work. According to each one's work. And that is, that is a correct translation. The word work there in the Greek is singular. So although it says deeds, that can be misleading. Some people take that as to, to say, well, God judges each and every individual thing you do. That's not what Peter is saying here. He's saying he judges your work as a whole. The, 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 uh, uh, the entirety of your life takes into account here. So if you call on God as father, if you are his child, remember back in verse 13, he said, children who are obedient or as obedient children live a holy life, live a separated life from the world. He says, remember this responsibility that the father judges impartially. So, there was a, there's a part in uh, Mark, when John the Baptist comes on the scene and he's baptizing these Jews, the Jewish people are coming to, to hear this new message, because John the Baptist was a, he was a front runner, right? He was preparing the way for Christ, and he has all these Jews there, and he has the Pharisees, and he says this very very interesting thing to them, and it means something for us. He says, don't think Because you are a seed of Abraham, that you have a place in heaven. Meaning, don't just, don't take so much uh, security in the fact that you were born into a Jewish family that you're in. And the same goes for us. Some of us have been raised in Christian families. So we assume, well, hey, I'm I'm a Christian. Why? Because I'm an American. You know, I was was raised in a Christian family. I go to church. What he's saying here is if, if you call yourself a Christian, if you call on him as father who judges your life's work impartially, no favoritism, don't be so confident in the fact that you were born into a Christian family. And we're gonna we're gonna add to that. Okay, we're not don't just Turn your brain off right there, because it's important. We have to, we have to kind of build something, uh, a foundation to understand where he's going when he says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. That can be confusing. And last week, we looked at 1 John chapter 4, where John the Apostle says, listen, fear can cause somebody to just concentrate on judgment. See, perfect love drives out fear. And I said, if you have, if you have Peter standing here and you have John standing here and they're giving a debate on how we are to live our lives, one saying, don't fear, the other was saying, to fear, so it would seem that they're in contradiction. But in fact, we're going to find out they are in complete alignment with each other. And it's very important as a Christian to understand the difference. And I also draw uh, our attention last week was to verse 13, where it says, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be revealed at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So how do you set your hope fully on grace And also conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Well, the fact is, is that Peter in here is demonstrating that the two, 
the fear that he's talking about and the hope that he's talking about are actually in con, uh, are married together. And how? How does that work? Well, let's look at some of these things. Some have said here where he says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time of exile. Well, this means that we are to fear God. Well, does it say that? Let's just take the first thing you do with Bible interpretation, and that is observation. Okay? So let's observe the context of, of what he's talking about. First Peter here, he's, he's talking about, starting in verse 13, about preparing your mind. Make sure your mind is, is ready. It's, it's sober. It's clear thinking based upon all the theology he said before verse 13. How do we know that? Because the conjunction, therefore, connects what's behind it. Okay, so be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace And then he says, as obedient children. So this is a personal issue, an individual issue. As Christians, we we so often focus on these cliches of, of God loves you, okay, grace, okay, salvation, okay, sin, uh, all these things. But we don't focus a lot on how we are to live our our lives. How the question I always have for the preachers, that's, that's good stuff, but how do I do it? H- how do I do it? And so Peter is telling us here, the context as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So really, is he focused on the fear of God? Or is the focus of this passage really how we are to live our lives? our individual daily lives. Now, I'm not saying not to fear God. But we can't just say where he says, conduct yourselves in fear. Oh, well, that means to fear God. And some people have said, well, it doesn't really mean to fear God. It means to just reverence God, you know, have a respect for God. Well, I think that it means much more than that. There's more included in this conduct yourselves with fear. The word conduct has to do with your action. It actually has a picture in the Greek as as a wheel turning, constantly in motion. So this is how you live your daily life. He's saying to live your daily life in reverent fear. The question is reverent fear of what? That's what we have to get today. That's... That's my objective, is that we would walk out of here and have no question of what Peter is saying we are to have reverent fear for. Now, verse 18. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from your futile ways inherited from your forefathers. Not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or splot. One thing that we really don't do a lot of as Christians is actually examining yourself. So often our focus is on other people and what other people are doing or not doing. So often we're focused on, well, did you see so-and-so? Or did you hear about such-and-such? You know, I wonder if they're even a Christian. And they call themselves a Christian. Can you believe that? You You know the conversations. Heck, I've had that conversation. Okay? Because the devil wants us to be focused on everybody else. But you know what the Bible says? It says... To examine yourself. There's a verse, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Paul says, examine yourself to see whether or not you are in the faith. It doesn't say to go around and ask whether or not so-and-so's in the faith. It says, you personally examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. Peter does the same thing in the next book, 2 Peter. Therefore, brothers... Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. 
So he's telling the individual, be diligent, firm your calling and election. Examine your own heart and see whether or not you are in the faith. Why is this important? Why is it important to do that? And some preachers have discouraged this and said, well, you know, this can cause too many people to doubt their salvation. Now, I'm not saying that we should go around daily in doubting your salvation. Because it, it does happen. If it doesn't happen, there's something wrong if you sometimes question. Well, there's a verse in Matthew 7 that is probably one of the scariest verses in the Bible. And I preach this one often because I can read in it the importance of the believer's knowing. And in this church, we're going to know this verse. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it will be many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Now that is a contradiction to a great majority of, of TV preachers. Jesus said, the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, here's the, here's the scary, scary part. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you take just for a second and examine what that actually means. Who calls Jesus Lord? Only those who make a profession of Christ. Only those who call themselves Christians call Jesus Lord. Muslims do not call him Lord. Hindus do not call him Lord. Christians Atheists don't call him Lord. Those who say they're Christian call him Lord. Why is this important? Because Jesus said, many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord. What he's saying, there's going to be a multitude of people who will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, but didn't I pray in your name? Didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? I fasted, I went to church, I gave money, I went downtown and helped the homeless. I did all kinds of things, God. Wait a minute, I'm one of yours. And he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. For I never knew you. Now how does that connect to where we are today in 1 Peter? Conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time in exile. What this is telling us is that the fear will protect you. That fear is going to protect you as you walk along the narrow way. Because as you're living your daily life, you're examining yourself against the scripture, not against the other folks in this church, not against the other folks in your family. You're asking, do I line up with scripture as obedient children? Be holy as I am holy. Are you striving to be more like Christ? Am I striving to be more like Christ, to be holy, to be an obedient child because I call him Father who judges impartially according to each man's work, the work as a whole. Meaning, here's the deal. At the end, we will be judged according to faith. Our faith. Our faith will produce the work and which will bring about the truth and the reality of what you believe. I am not saying a salvation through works. 
What I'm saying is that James is correct when he says, show me your faith without works and I'll show you dead faith. Paul and James are in agreement. Peter, Paul, James, they're all in agreement here. Your faith and your work is connected. Now, another thing is that there are people who will deceive them own, their own selves. They think because I'm doing such and such and such and such, I'm in, I'm good. Look, my work is, is wonderful. Remember Matthew 7, right? Jesus said, many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, but they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. For he who does the will of my Father will enter. And what is the rebuttal of the multitudes? But Lord, I prophesied in your name. I prayed in your name. I went to church. I did this and I did that. Look at my works, God. Look, I've stacked them up for you. Look at all of them. Look what I've done. You see? The Christian takes the crown of glory that's given to him as a reward, throws it down at the feet of Christ. Read the book of Revelation. Because they know Before the foundation of the world, I was chosen to be adopted as his son. Every work that I've ever done is because of his grace alone. I have no part in it. I take no boasting at all. Zero. And I cast it at his feet. But the non-believer, the one professing Christian who Jesus is talking about, and my prayer is that none of us would be this, says, but look at what I've done. Here's all the proof I'm a Christian. It's all here. All this, look at all this stuff. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. How does that line up with what Peter's saying? Because our actions, as we live our lives, if you conduct your life in this reverent fear of knowing that what I do is displayed to the heavenly realms, Remember Ephesians 3? The very wisdom, manifold wisdom of God is displayed to the heavenly realms, to the angels who look in, who long to look in as to what God is doing. Our actions demonstrate that. Jesus said, everything that is hidden will be brought to light. No one's getting away with nothing. No one is getting away with nothing. There are people today who think they've gotten away with stuff and that is untrue. Everything will be brought to the light. But John 3 says men hate the light so because it exposes the deeds of evil and they run into darkness. This is an important verse because it helps us to understand the warnings of Scripture. There are many warnings in Scripture that would allude to, if you didn't read it correctly, you would think, well, is this saying I can lose my salvation? No, what this is saying is make sure you're in the faith. Make your calling and election sure. Don't be so secure that you become indifferent and just don't really care. It's like, whatever, I've been a Christian for a long time, you know? No, no, don't ever do that. Don't ever come to that place. Now, am I saying not to have confidence in Christ? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, when we have confidence that, hey, 15 years ago, I used to do all kinds of stuff. I used to be involved in this and be involved in that. I taught Bible study. I did this and did that. Charles Spurgeon said, never, ever put your hope in what you have done. But what are you doing? What are you doing? If Jesus said, go and make disciples... The mission of a Christian is to go and make disciples. Teach them to obey what I have taught you. How many disciples have you made? I'm not talking about converts. I'm not talking about going and evangelizing and getting a decision for Christ. I'm talking about who have you taken and taught what Jesus has taught you. And if if your answer is, well, none or not very many... My question is why? Why? 
Maybe it's the fact that there's not a lot of preachers teaching us to do that. Maybe. Could be. But you can start today. You can start producing that, that work through faith. Now, the fear is also connected to verse 19, 18 and 19. Okay? Here we go. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefather. The, the word knowing there is very important to understand. The perfect tense, meaning this is something you have come to realization in the past, but it's continuing through now in the present and in the future. Meaning that this knowing, what he's fixing to say, is something we as Christians need to renew our mind on all the time. This will help you to stay on the narrow path, knowing that you were ransomed. Do you get that? The word ransomed, to be redeemed, it speaks of someone who is in slavery, and they have no hope of getting out, ever. But someone buys you back. Someone buys you. Someone you don't even know buys you and sets you free. Free from the bondage of sin, the power of sin, and the judgment of sin. Knowing. Do you know that? Do you know you were redeemed? Let me tell you, if you do, that will cause you to fear. Fear what? Fear violating the relationship of my father. When I was a boy, a teenage boy, I was rebellious. I don't have time to tell you all about it, but I was. I wasn't a Christian. I did not follow Christ. And my dad, although was not perfect by any means, he did the best he could. And I know he loved me. But let me, I'm going to use a little illustration. It's not a good one, but it's one I just came to mind. He told me there was a party out in the country I wanted to go to. And he said, son, I wish you wouldn't go. Now, he knew the kind of rebellious kid I was. If he was to demand or say, well, you're out of here or fight with me, that would only inflame my rebelliousness. And he looked at me and he said, son, I really, I just don't have a good feeling about this. I wish you wouldn't go. Well, I'm going. And I went. And I stayed out. I came home in the morning. It's about 6.30 in the morning. Smelled like a brewery. Was in all kinds of debauchery. And when I walked through the door, I didn't expect it coming through. But you know what I saw? I saw a man sitting at the table who looked like he had been, been up worried all night long. And as I walked by him, he looked at me, and I looked at him, and we made eye contact. And I saw fear, I saw worry in him that I'd never seen before as a 16-year-old boy, or cared about, really. I'm telling you, I was, I was not very good. I had a very arrogant attitude. But that look broke me because I realized that I had really disappointed him. I really kept him up. He was really worried, where in fact I thought, well, he don't care that he's going to go to sleep. No, he stayed up all night long. He wasn't really a praying man. But he loved his son. And the point here is the fear of violating the very relationship you have with the father. How did you get that relationship? You were ransomed. You were ransomed. You were ransomed from the feudal ways that you and I inherited from our forefathers. Generational curses. Generational things. Depression. Right? They say, well, it's, it could be hereditary. Teenage pregnancy, drug addiction, alcoholism, divorce. You see these patterns in families. You can't tell me you don't. Well, the Old Testament says the sins of the fathers will fall into the laps of the children. That's why what I do as a dad is going to affect generations to come. I know a man, he's a seventh generation pastor, beautiful family, it's not perfect, but it's beautiful, and I wanted to emulate that, I really did, and I said, hey, would you help me to, I don't have no idea how to be a husband when I first became a Christian, I said, would you teach me, and I've got a baby coming, and I don't have a clue how to be a daddy, I said, it's amazing what you have, you know what he told me, 
He said, I am blessed, very blessed, but I'm only blessed because of the de decisions of the men behind me. My father and his father and his father is where my family is blessed now. But it says you've been redeemed from those feudal ways that was inherited. You've been redeemed from it. You've been purchased. Purchased by what? Silver and gold, a million dollars, billion dollars? No. No, and in fact, Peter uses that on purpose. Because silver and gold is the most costly thing in the universe. Can't buy nothing. Nothing. So Peter then says, no, not by silver or gold, which are perishable, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You see, when you grab a hold of that, it causes you to fear. It causes you to walk in the narrow way. When the devil says, come and do this, you say, no. Just like Joseph, Potiphar, right? Guarantee you, she was not an ugly woman. She was probably beautiful. And she was giving herself to him. He's a young man. They say he's about 17 years old. Come and lie with me. Come and be with me. And he runs out the door. And do you know what he said? I cannot sin against my God. I will not sin against my God, my Father. Do you have that attitude? Do you? Or do we what? Forget that the Father judges impartially. Just because I call myself a Christian, it makes it okay for me to run around and sin. When in fact it says live a holy life. Be holy because he is holy. And don't forget, you were ransomed. Not by silver and gold. You were ransomed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The hypostatic union. How is this blood precious? Because man sinned. The only one who can pay for that sin is a man. Adam was a man. He disobeyed God, fell, and the whole human race inherited. You see, we have no concept of sin and the enormous power it has and the influence. We think of murder and rape and things like that as the most heinous sins that can be, and they are, they are heinous. But remember, what caused the entire human race to fall and to be condemned? He was eating a piece of fruit, but they were told not to. You say, oh man, that's, why did God do that? Why is he so harsh? Because he's holy and we are not. We don't understand. We have no concept of what it means to disobey a holy, righteous, magnificent, wonderful, pure God. We have no clue. But this gives us just a picture, and this is what we're going to hold on to as we close. It was so huge, so amazing, this sin had to be paid for by a man. But the only man that could survive the wrath of God to be poured out on him is God himself. So this hypostatic union of Jesus Christ, the God-man, fully man, but fully God, precious blood of Christ without spot or blemish, holy, sinless life in the same world you and I live in, yet without sin. And he died. He was murdered, foreordained before the foundation of the world so that you and you and you and you and I could be saved, could be saved from that wrath, could be saved on that day of judgment when the entirety of our work is weighed in the balance and is it compared, does it have, is it connected with faith? Faith in what? Faith in this blood, faith in this God, man, faith in the propitiation that satisfies his wrath, that he rose from the dead, that we have now been born again to a living hope. Do you have that living hope? Do you? Do you live your life in fear as we're here on earth? And this fear is not supposed to cause us to run around in terror. 
This fear is as if you're walking and you come to the edge of a cliff. Who's ever done that? Go as far to the edge of a cliff as you can get. You get that little thing in your tummy, you know. It causes you to step back. It causes you to get back. Well, that's, that's what he's talking about. As you are going towards sin, being tempted by your own desires, and before you, oh, you get back because you were redeemed, you were ransomed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and you don't want to do anything to violate or grieve the God of the universe who's given you life. Use that this week as we walk out of here. And there's going to come a time you're going to, you're going to have to you're going to be presented with an opportunity for mercy or grace or forgiveness. You're going to be presented with an opportunity for self-control. Use this fear, this fear of violating the relationship you have with a holy God who loved you enough, loved me enough to provide a way to be redeemed, not with silver or gold, but with the most precious substance in the entire universe, the blood of Jesus Christ. The warnings in scripture are there. They are there to keep us back from going off that narrow path that Jesus talks about. Don't be one of those who stands before Jesus and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You have an opportunity today. We're all alive here today. The gospel is being proclaimed Do not miss the opportunity and harden your heart. Receive it in faith so that the Father who judges impartially, no favoritism, will judge according to our faith in Christ, in that precious blood. So fear causes, or love, love causes healthy fear when you see the love in which we've been given. The love in which God has given us, when you grab a hold of that, it will cause you to fear offending that God. It will cause you to fear not being called, not being true, not being in the electing love of God. And if you examine yourself, you examine, and you're like, I'm not sure what profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul. So how do you be sure? You grab a hold of the faith I'm talking about in Jesus Christ and you throw everything else away. You get it as far away from you as possible and you grab a hold with confidence. What Jesus has done is finished. It's over. It's once. It's for all. I will never let go of it. And that fear keeps you from letting go. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the, for the truth that is just so evident that we have been set apart, born again to a living hope, the resurrected Christ who's living and reigning today, who will come again. You will come and you could come right now, Lord. Let us be servants who would hear the words, well done, good and faithful. Well done. Let us be connected with faith. Let us hold on to that faith in that precious blood that was shed for us so that we receive forgiveness of sin, not trying to do it according to our works, not trying to do it according to, well, I hope, I hope in the end I'll have more good than bad. Let us throw that all away, God, and just cover us with that blood of Christ that if we're standing there and we're, we're brought out before men to be shot, whatever, give a testimony of what the hope of glory is in within you that we would be standing there holding and clinging on to the cross and boasting nothing else thank you for this church I pray that today you were glorified I pray that you have been lifted up and I pray that what you said in your word you will draw men unto you you will be lifted up like Moses lifted a snake up on a pole you will be lifted up and you will draw men unto yourself so I pray that today that through the power of your gospel we as Christians would hold on to it knowing this continual knowing and those who may sit in this room who don't know you have not been born again would cling to that hope and be born again it's in Jesus name I pray amen